And uh, before we get started with our guest speaker, do any of our committee chairs have anything to share with the rest of the group this evening? I have something to share from Carol Le Levine. Um, and she asked me to remind everyone that it's a great time of year to uh, give to CWTA and our wonderful actions and um, our wonderful members and constituency. So we're, we're really uh, doing a little ask at this time. So thank you. And, and why do we need uh, contributions, Judith? Why do we need them to support <laughs> to support our work? Um, we, um, as many of you know, we um, hold we've held mayoral forums for the candidates for our mayors. We've held two of those. We've held one um, a gubernatorial forum. We provide information on key issues. Um, related to uh, public safety, health, um, uh, climate change and environmental justice, et cetera. And um, our budget isn't huge, but we, we do need funds. And especially as we go in to this election year where so much is at stake um, locally in the state and nationally. Um, and we really want to ramp up our efforts to save democracy as well as working in our key issues. All right. See, I never ask people for money unless uh, we tell them why we need the money. So uh, that is a great policy. <laughs> that, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Membership. Uh, 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 so I see uh, Tina Padilla. Padilla is on this call. She came to the mixer. Hello. You're you're in the dark there, but uh, I want to thank you for coming. I'm not sure uh, if anybody else is uh, on this call. There you are. Thank you. Anyone else who was at the mixer, this great mixer we had this month is on this call. Why don't you identify yourself so we can just welcome you once more again uh, or put your name in the chat. Whatever it is, but uh, it was a, just a, as a membership wrap up, it was a very successful evening and we look forward to another one in the spring, but, uh, and we did get a new member and now we're looking for a lot more new members. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Uh, any other chairs? Uh, Jane. Yeah. Yes. Um, and Andy uh, chime in too. Um, so uh, D and I are co-chairs of the, uh, community accountability for safety and what was the um, accountability police violence uh, um, uh, police accountability and gun violence prevention um, so we want to urge all of our um, members and all those uh, who joined us today um, to go to the district police district council meetings please um, what we're looking for representatives from each of the districts um, and this is our way as uh, citizens to hold the police accountable um, and for us to provide input on what's happening in our community, input on policy um, when we uh, um, agree and disagree. Um, and so the district councils are the brand new uh, um, elected uh, uh, bodies in each of the police districts um, that give us an opportunity to go and um, and hold the police accountable. This is important locally. It's it's a model nationally. Um, so we work, urge uh, folks to do that. Um, and I will, let me just to add one other thing. Um, CWTA has joined a coalition um, that is has come out together um, to uh, um, comment relative to the Fraternal Order of Police as um, uh, is is trying to get accepted for a new contract that would actually allow them to go around the new law and not be held accountable um, for there not to, to for there not to be transparency around police disciplinary actions. Um, so we strongly uh, disagree with that, along with many other allies. And so we are working in coalition to say to the mayor, to say to the city council, the the uh, the FOP, which is the police union. Um, um, uh, request to go around the new law to hold the police accountable is unacceptable. So uh, we want our members to join us 
um, in sending that message to to our aldermen. And Dee, uh, if we've uh, if I missed something, if there's a, an additional, um, uh, I turn it to you. Thank you. No, uh, no, that's fine. Both of those things. Uh, but if anybody on this call uh, needs further information, just email uh, Jane or me, and we'll give you all the information. It's 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 fabulous. I've gone to several of the meetings. And you will be very impressed, I think, uh, with how they're going forward. So it really is a chance for us, as Jane suggested, to have impact on policy. So let's take advantage of it. So uh, Jane and Dee, um, can you give Kat something to post on our on our webpage uh, about it so that if people didn't get down all the information, they can refer to it? Sure. OK, and thanks. Uh, any uh, other committee yeah, chair? Yeah, I have, I have something. Mary? So. We're going to, the health committee, we're going to be doing some work with citizens action around their um, uh, lowering drug cost policies. Oh. So Deb and I are going to be talking to them soon and we'll keep you all posted. It would probably involve, we might be doing an op-ed or something like that. It would be an op-ed from us from Chicago Women Take Action, probably on citizen action. Uh, also, I just want to say that Deb and I have, have been going to the 18th District Police Council and it's really interesting and i'll report more at the board meeting but if anyone else is going to their district meetings please let us know okay and let jane know too but let us know as well so we can figure out how we can all meet together and you know craft out some things that we want to get out of this or that how we would like to help them that's all got it. thank you mary uh tina <laughs> Can I ask a question about you when you go to these um, meetings, these board meetings, and you said you um, take notes or do you have a hard, you know, I don't know if you go to one of these meetings, I would like to like know what to take notes on and public meetings are a little different. Sometimes I do too much. And then the main points are lost and all my blah, blah, blah. We would be happy to share that with you. Yeah. Because we, have, um, we can send you uh, the CWA, CWTA position uh, with regard to police and um, and give you one or two or three little little points. Um, uh, right what now, listen we're for. concentrating on the, uh, on the new contract and you can ask and they have public comment at every meeting so you can just get up and speak and uh, certainly in our police district they're very cordial uh, you only can speak for three minutes so it's good to maybe jot something down before but we'd be jane and i will put together a little 10 point plan or five points or something like that and also they they send you their slides and their minutes so you'll you'll have them because they post them on their website so okay. Right. So we'll, meetings, give, we'll give you those links. Posted, right. Look at that. Yeah, and I really want to just thank you for um, for being there and going and and for even your questions so that we can you know work together. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Any other committee chairs with anything to share tonight? Uh, I don't see any other indications. Um, okay. Uh, Betty, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Jackie. And I want to say welcome again to all of our guests who are attending. Um, Miss Gray is my mentee. I've heard her speak several times, and I don't really want to infringe on her time <laughs> by going through her long resume, which you may have seen when you registered uh, to be on this call tonight only to say that I don't know that she needs a mentor because she is really, really great. And I think you're going to be excited. She has a great presentation and I am not going to take up her time only to say, Agnes Gray, I am so happy to have you here and speaking to us tonight on election protection. And I'm happy to have all the guests that have tuned in to hear you. So with that, I will turn it over to you and let everybody listen. 
Thank you so much for the introduction, Miss Betty, and thank you, Chicago Women Take Action, for the invite. Um, I was able to join you all at the um, mixer, and I thoroughly enjoyed myself. So when I got the invitation, I was super excited. I am getting ready to um, share my screen because I do have a presentation that I want to share with you all. So just give me one moment. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm going to try to see if I can get in presenter's view. <clears throat> there we go. Oh, no, you're not presenter. Sorry. Hold on. I need to do. There we go. All righty. Can everyone still see my screen okay? Yes. Perfect. And I'm just going to try to move my toolbar. All right. So good evening, everyone. My name is Agnes Gray. I work on community engagement at Common Cause Illinois, and my email is listed at the bottom if you need to contact me. Um, at the end, if there is uh, a reason you need to reach out to me and you did not catch my email, please let me know and I'll drop it in the chat. A few housekeeping rules. I want to be cognizant of time, so if you will allow me to get through my slides, I might kind of go over some uh, quicker than others, just to try to make sure that we touch on everything. But I am going to be cognizant of trying to leave um, space for questions at the end. And if you could please put yourself on mute so that we don't distract anyone who's paying attention to the presentation, I would greatly appreciate it. All right. So to start off, I do want to discuss a little bit of just about who Common Cause is. So Common Cause, we are a nonpartisan grassroots organization, and um, we have been dedicated to upholding the core values of American democracy since 1970. Um, we have 1.5 million members, and we have supporters all across the country. And in 1971, we led the campaign that won the 26th Amendment, which allowed 18-year-olds to vote. And we are very proud of that. So that just shows the longevity of the work that we've been doing nationally. Um, and we have Common Cause chapters in 30 states, and we are still in the process of growing. So why I'm here this evening, I'm here to speak to you about election protection, which is a major component of what we do when there is an election happening. And because we're going into the 2024 election, um, this is a wonderful time to discuss this. One thing that I like to emphasize is that 2024 and the elections, I don't say anymore, oh, it's coming, it's here. So we need to be prepared. So goals of election protection. We want to provide trusted nonpartisan information, help voters, um, have their ballot counted and report and resolve any issues. So oftentimes people ask me, who is election protection? Well, voter advocates, legal professionals, faith and clergy, and you and your neighbors. Yes, I'm talking about each and every one of you who are on this call. You as a trusted member of your community are an important part of what we do with our election protection program. Why does election protection matter? Well, we know that there's relatively low turnout during primary elections. And so that means that more, more candidates are buying for votes and there is a, a higher potential for aggressive electioneering. Um, also, we want people from the community to serve as a friendly face, as a trusted member of your community. One of the challenges with election protection and why I'm so excited to engage with you all this evening is because we really want to recruit people from their community. We don't want to have to send someone from somewhere else to serve a community that they don't live in. But in order to do that, we have to have engagement from people across the state. 
Last but not least, it is very important to understand that election protection is not just here for voters. It is also here for election workers and election administrators. And so part of um, your role as a volunteer with election protection would be to support election workers and address voter issues. So first, I want to start off with a brief game. Um, so to the left, you will see... Um, you will see vocabulary words, and then you will see definitions that you can match with them. So if you would be kind enough to just put your answer in the chat, I'm going to give you a few like seconds to put your answer in. Um, so starting with number one, absentee ballot. If you could put in the chat what your answer is based upon the definitions that are listed on the opposite side of the vocabulary words. Okay, if you put G for number one, you are correct. Number two, early voting site. If you put A for number two, you are correct. Number three, election official. Okay, so number three can be a bit tricky, but the correct answer um, would actually be E for that one, election official. Number four, polling place. If you put H, you are correct. Number five, roving poll monitor. And this might be a new word for some of you and that's okay, we'll talk about that a little bit today. All right, if you put, if you put um, D for number five, you are correct. Number six, poll worker. So for some of you who might have gotten confused on number three, I want to be very clear in distinguishing the difference for this one, okay? So for number six, I'm going to give people one more second or so to put their answer in. Okay, so number six is C. So a person hired by county to work on the team managing the polling place. Okay, so six is C. All right, what about number seven, provisional ballot? If you put B, you are correct. Number eight, there should only be one letter left. Voting machine. All right, if you put F, you are correct. Great job, everyone, and thank you so much for participating. Okay, so I want to just dive in a bit here about the structure of election protection. And to do that, it's important to emphasize some of the main categories of calls that we receive on election day. So when we're reporting issues to the 866 Our Vote hotline, the top three categories that we see are issues around polling place access, voter intimidation, um, photo ID or registration issues. And so this is um, something that we see. It's important to understand that in the state of Illinois, you do not have to have a photo ID, but there are still times when we get calls from voters 
who are just trying to make sure that that is the case or they're trying to make sure they have all their documentation. And that's when we let them know they do not have to provide voter ID. Oftentimes you hear about election protection around election time. But I'm here to tell you that that is not the only time that we are working and focused on elections. We focus on elections 365 days a year. And really, that just boils down to problem solving. So even before the election, building relationship with um, local election officials, boards of elections, um, county clerks, monitoring and addressing polling place changes. We know that with redistricting, people did end up getting um, new polling locations. So trying to educate the community on their new polling place, also help community members understand what might have happened to change that information. Um, and then we also like to look at what issues we want to anticipate. We do coordination and we try to figure out how many poll monitors we need to be able to fully be effective. On election day, uh, we're working with local elect elected officials to solve problems, extend polling hours, and to also um, remove police presence or to be there in the event that someone um, is feeling intimidated. So it might not be a police presence. It can just be um, private security at the polling place. And then after election day, we also um, try to work to change the voting process through administrative changes or legislation. So we utilize what we're seeing on election day to help us with our legislative agenda and to also try to find ways that we can make some changes administratively as well. And so it's important to understand that um, like legal and policy advocates when necessary are also present throughout these different phases of election protection. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this number, but 866-R-VOTE is a number to remember. This is the election protection hotline, and there are numerous lines for various languages. Um, so if if you, you know, need this information, please let me know, and I can get you a flyer that has all of these numbers listed. What I'm really excited to speak with you all about is the different components of our election protection program. So we have the traditional poll monitor, these people rove and they're outside of the polling place. You know, they're assessing electioneering, if there's any in intimidation happening, if there is um, excess security or police presence. Um, then we have our nonpartisan poll watchers, and these people are actually inside of the polling place. So they're in the polling place watching what's happening as people actually uh, cast their ballot. They're looking at what, regist um, not registration, but when people go to check in so that they can get their ballot, what that experience is like. Um, and then election workers. So election workers are a part of this process as well. There are some counties that reach out to us and say, hey, we have an election worker shortage. Can you please spread the word, get the information out there? Um, this year, I'm excited to announce that we are introducing two new components to our election protection program here in Illinois. And that um, first um, will be digital democ democracy activists. So these could also be called social media monitors, but I like to steer away from social media because everyone, everyone is not is as, um, everyone is not as, how do I put it? Tech savvy. Or even sometimes the word social media can be discouraging. And to be honest, if we say social media monitor, it does not fully capture what we do because someone doesn't have to be on social media to be able to report what they're seeing when it comes to election falsehoods. We do understand that there are other uh, means of election falsehoods outside of just what we see on social media. So we wanted to be sure to be as inclusive as possible with this. And then last but not least, the post-election observer. Um, so this is a representative of common cause assigned to carefully observe post-election canvassing 
um, in that process, and they are assigned to specific locations for this as well. So the core component of what we do are our field volunteers. And to go over some of our field volunteer roles, um, so, so we have the roving pole monitors. I talked about what they do. They're outside um, answering questions for voters um, that are coming to the polling place. Um, it's important to emphasize the eligibility for this is a three um, hour minimum commitment, um, reliable mode of transportation, um, and there is no Illinois residency or regist uh, registered voter requirements for this particular role because these individuals are outside of the polling place. Um, but for our nonpartisan poll watchers, as I mentioned, these are the individuals inside and eligibility for this is six hour minimum commitment and you have to be a registered Illinois voter. Um, the reason for the difference in the time commitment is because depending on what county or municipality, because we know like the city of Chicago has its own election authority, we at Common Cause have to make sure that you have all the proper paperwork to be able to go to a polling place when you are inside of the polling place. So it takes a lot of legwork for us to be able to do that. And so we want to make sure um, that when we're doing that work on the front end, that people know that it is a bit more of a time commitment because we have to be in constant communication with election authorities about who's coming, who's going. And so we tend to try to have longer shifts for that. But these individuals, as I mentioned, are inside the polling place. So they are not impacted by what's going outside, going on outside with the weather or other um, factors as well. So, just to briefly share with you what field volunteer responsibilities consist of. A, answer voter questions. B, help solve problems. C, capture the information of voters who experience issues. Um, C, no, D, um, assist legal field volunteers with problems or questions. Um, e, identify problems that require intervention from your local command center. And um, F, ensure the polling place is accessible for all voters. So some of the challenges that we've seen in some examples, um, in 2016, there were multiple social media reports that um, ISU ran out of ballots, okay? So what's so wrong with this? Well, first and foremost, that did not occur. Um, the issue with something like this being put out there is that if someone, if that is someone's assigned polling location and they're being told they don't have ballots, you cannot vote. What does that mean? People are likely going to leave or not go to that polling site. And if someone has already taken off or made the time to go to, to start traveling to their polling site, it's very rare that they're going to go back to that polling site. So that's something that we saw in 2016 and 2020, um, extreme use of security or local law enforcement presence at polling locations. Um, this can be intimidating. Even if it's not intentional, it can still be a sign of voter intimidation. Um, targeting of non-English speaking or English as a second language voters. Um, and then also there was a particular polling place where an officer demanded that a photo must be taken of a voter before they could cast their ballot. This is not a thing here in Illinois should not have ever been said and people should not have felt the need to do this in order to vote. Um, so once again, having somebody on the grounds there that could assess this and escalate the issue um, so that we could make sure that it got resolved, that's so important. In 2022, um, voters were asked to provide proof of ID. This was in Champaign County and also in Cook County. Um, and so... Once again, that is not necessary here in the states of Illinois. And so we want to make sure voters know that. Um, and one more thing that we saw in 2022, voters were concerned around marking their ballot with a Sharpie 
versus a pen. Um, we saw a lot of reports of this. So being able to explain that it's okay if your polling place is using a Sharpie over a pen, it sounds simple, right? But voters are really concerned and there's a lot of um, distrust and just a lot of information out there. So we wanna make sure that we have people placed to be able to address concerns. As I mentioned earlier, we are not just here for the voters. We are also here for election officials and workers. Um, and so 2020 brought about an increase of harassment and threats and false claims of ballot stuffing. Um, so this is when you saw election workers be targeted. Um, in Champaign County 2022, there was actually um, uh, there was actually a filing where someone attempted to remove an election judge because they accused them of ballot stuffing. What ended up happening, someone saw that this particular um, election worker had ballots in their car and they reported that they were ballot stuffing. They were just test ballots. They were not official ballots. They were test ballots. Um, the worker was not doing anything wrong. The concerning part about this, though, is that the photo that was taken as proof was in a locked and secured parking lot. OK, so that means that somebody got through the security measures to take a picture inside of this person's car. And so this is just an example of what's at stake. Um, what election workers and election officials, like what scrutiny and magnifying glass they're under. And so we feel like it's so important to remind people that we are there for the entire process, whether it's the voter or those working the elections, because without the election workers, we don't have safe, secure elections and we are not able to get the election done in a timely manner. So we want to make sure that we show them love and support as well. So post-election monitoring, I love talking about this because the average person I speak to, they think that the election is over when we get the results on election night. But I'm here to let you in on a secret. That is not the end of the election process. That is just one component and those numbers are unofficial results. So understand that when polls close on election day, our election process here in the state of Illinois has not ended. Um, there's still the canvas process because people who cast a um, mail-in ballot, they have until election day, as long as their ballot is postmarked, not it doesn't have to arrive by election day, as long as it's postmarked by election day, their ballot can still be counted. So we do understand that we have to leave um, a window of time for those ballots to come in. Additionally, some people may have had to vote provisionally on election day. So it's still those ballots have to go through a vetting process as well. And we want to make sure that every ballot is counted, no matter if it's a mail-in voted um, a mail-in ballot, a provisional ballot. We want every vote to be counted. Um, and so we need volunteers engaged in every asp aspect of the election from start to finish. Um, so once the canvassing process happens, um, the local municipalities have their own certification process, then the state does its certification process. And then that's when Congress does their certification process. So um, I always love sharing with people that the election is not over on that Tuesday evening. Post-election, again, one thing that we do with this are recounts. So this is not necessarily a common occurrence in Illinois, but Common Cause Illinois does participate in them when necessary. Um, and a great example of this is in 2020 when um, there was, there were claims of um, some things happening that favored one candidate over the other. Um, and there were different um, lies spread and falsehoods put out there that questioned the integrity of the initial count. And so we partnered with the local election clerk, um, the NAACP and League of Women Voter Chapters in DuPage County um, for the 2020 election to address this and to um, 
engage in this recount. So once again, that is not as common in Illinois, but sometimes it is necessary. All right, so as I mentioned in the last slide, um, because of some falsehoods and some narratives that were put out there, um, there were a lot of questions around the integrity of a specific count in DuPage County. Um, and so I do want to talk about how we can try to combat some of these falsehoods. So it's important to understand that this is nothing new, even though my particular slide starts off in 2016, there have been isolated incidents um, of election falsehoods. But just for the sake of this presentation, I want to go back to 2016, where we know um, Russia um, really attempted to infiltrate our election system. And there was proof of Russian interference following the 2016 elections. Um, in 2020, we saw an uprise in election denialism. And then 2022, specifically for the state of Illinois, the creation of fabricated news sources. So this could be print or online. Um, as I mentioned, that's why I'm steering clear from just social media monitoring. And I want to really emphasize that um, digital democracy activists, because this wasn't necessarily an attempt that was online um, with social media. There were some hard copy, like newspapers dropped in certain neighborhoods to target certain communities. And so if something like that happens, we want everyone to have a space to be able to report these instances. So why do bad actors spread election falsehoods? Well, sometimes it's for personal gain. It can be for money, fame, political influence. Um, in some cases, it can be to suppress voter turnout. If they know that a particular community uh, will have a great impact for um, another candidate that they're not supporting, they might want to influence that. And they by by creating confusion around the um, voting process, creating a culture of fear um, and distrust during the election. So this fear and distrust, it actually uh, contributes to voter apathy. And we know a lot of times people often will tell us, oh my goodness, why should I vote? It's going to be the, the same thing no matter who's in charge. But at the end of the day, voting is the one way that you can really make a difference. I tell people all the time, if you don't vote, you don't have a voice. And so part of what we really want to do is encourage people. It's not about who to vote for, but that you exercise that right to vote. Um, and so it's really important that we uh, manufacture support for future suppression bills to be passed during the legislative session. So once again, this is that component of not just during the election, but utilizing the information that we have from our election protection program and while people are out in the field to um, actually influence what we're doing when we go to the state legislature. Why is social media monitoring important? Well, it's more important than ever. Um, and so sharing pro-democracy content and reporting disinformation in your local and personal social media spaces is essential. You are our only line of defense in these closed spaces because we don't have access to them. Um, it's important to understand that you are fighting back against bad actors and protecting voters from harmful election disinformation. And we must win back the narrative online that our elections are trustworthy. To take it a step further, I want to emphasize the fact that we don't have the same level of securities that we once had when, um, when we were in 2020, okay? After 2016, a lot of social media companies understood what was at stake and how social media could be used um, to try to spread falsehoods and to dissuade voters from getting out to vote. Unfortunately, we don't have the same level of support from social media companies. And uh, when you look at Silicon Valley and you look at technology and what's happening at all these companies, they are downsizing. 
They are cutting jobs. And the first department that they're cutting is the department that actually monitored and reported and took down specific accounts or require people to take down posts that spread myths and disinformation. So we don't have that going for us going into 2024. And it's very important that we understand that. Our objectives are to support voters and try to be more proactive in our voter education. Um, we also want to fight voter suppression. So um, flag any type of election falsehoods. Oftentimes when I'm telling people about our digital de democracy activist component, many people wanna know, what do you do with the reports? Are we just reporting and is that it? And I'm here to tell you, no. We alert partners on the ground to disinformation um, in situations that are occurring at the polls in real time, okay? We also fact check and label content that is misleading or untrue. Um, we hold platforms accountable through litigation and press coverage. This puts pressure on them to do something. And we also connect voters to information using the nonpartisan 866 Our Vote Election Protection Hotline. So we're not just about calling out the issue, but we also want to resolve it. We put action behind what we're saying. Our impact. So through this social media uh, department and what we're doing in our trainings there, or our digital democracy activists, we have successfully, successfully removed and flagged problematic content. We removed harmful posts from X formerly known as Twitter and Facebook. Uh, we have been able to alert partners of what's happening at the polls. We were able to get posts flagged for PolitiFact and they were able to be fact-checked. And most importantly, we were able to assist voters. And this might be through social media or even connecting them with that 866 Our Vote hotline. So what's the difference between disinformation and misinformation? Disinformation is intentional attempts to cause harm by using false information to affect the participation of voters in elections. So conspiracy theories, use of intimidation. An important rule of thumb for disinformation is that disinformation seeks to provide a simple answer to complex questions and systems. If it seems too good to be true, and the math is not mathing, it likely is not true. Misinformation. When someone accidentally shares inaccurate information as a result of not having all the facts, um, and most times these people have fallen victim to, the, to disinformation. How we encourage people to address misinformation, we first say introduce yourself. So if you're a volunteer with us, you would introduce your name and say that you're a volunteer with common cause, um, you point out that the information that they are providing um, is not accurate. And you can let them know that it's been fact-checked and found to be untrue. You share with them where they can find more information that's accurate. And then you also request that they either um, edit the post or remove it so that it does not confuse others. And most importantly, Make sure that it is reported. How to address disinformation. Disinformation is different for us. We do not want you to comment. We do not want you to react. We do not want you to share and debunk how amplification works. So anytime you're interacting with um, someone around disinformation, all you do is create this algorithm that makes their information more prevalent and it makes people see it quicker um, and it can create further confusion. So when it comes to disinformation, we want you to disengage and we only want you to report it. Do not try to go back and forth with someone who's spreading disinformation. So typically what um, people report, so election misinformation and disinformation only, uh, we give 
priority to um, topics and locations. So there's a specific list that we provide for this. Um, recent instances of misinformation and disinformation, because people tend to work in shifts, something might have happened in another shift. Uh, and going into a new shift, we want to make sure that it's accurate and it's not something that has already been addressed in a previous shift. What not to report. We don't care about people's opinions. People are entitled to their opinions, no matter how you may feel about it, no matter how it might be wrong. We do not focus on opinions at all. And we don't look at candidate disinformation. We are nonpartisan, so we're not here to support a specific candidate over another. Um, and last but not least, we don't do anything around non-democracy related disinformation. So, you know, I love my games. Um, so we're getting ready to play a very short game. And just to go over the rules with you, I will um, have a screen up and a post will appear on the screen. And you will have roughly 20 seconds to decide whether to respond or just report. Um, you will then put either respond or report in the chat. Okay. So it's game time. And here we go. If you put report, you are correct. Here's the next one. If you put respond, you are correct. And last but not least, If you put report, you're correct. Thank you so much for playing respond or just report. So this just quickly shows you some of our targeted platforms. Um, so we have X formerly known as Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Nextdoor, TikTok, Facebook. One thing that we want to emphasize it is important that you do not try to infiltrate potentially hostile spaces. We encourage our volunteers to look at communities they are already a part of and to just monitor from that perspective. We would never ask you to put yourself in harm's way or to put yourself in a predicament where you might feel uncomfortable. <gasps> it is important to understand that with our strategy, um, the reason why social media monitoring is so important is because it is imperative that we build connections across communities and um, geographies as well. We want to meet voters where they are and we want it to be accessible um, from a direct action. Why we come to you is because you have more access than we do. We only have access to the public spaces, but because you are members of groups, whether it be private Facebook groups or, you know, everyone might not necessarily be in the same community. So the way that the community might be targeted might look different, but you have access to this information. And so you see more than we do, which is why your role is so important. With social media monitoring, it is important to know that while our volunteers are doing the parts in the red, we are constantly doing the parts in the blue where we're creating proactive content to um, any inoculation content to try to make sure that we are pushing information that's going to be valuable and that our volunteers and members of the community can use as a 
trusted source and guide navigating the election. So as we look ahead to 2024, I already talked about foreign interference in, in U.S. elections. We know what election denial looks like. Many of you have experienced firsthand localized fabricated news sources, but what makes 2024 unique is the impact of artificial intelligence. It's important to understand that technology is a wonderful thing, okay? And it is very useful, but it can also be harmful if we do not have the proper mechanisms in place to make sure it doesn't become a runaway train. So we're hearing a lot about things like chat GPT, and yes, it is an amazing tool. But it's important to understand that AI can be used for um, precise and personalized targeted messaging, automated election administration. It can be used to manipulate media and accelerating disinformation. Um, artificially generated images have already been deployed to create confusion in our elections. I'm not sure you all saw this, but I was looking very closely when um, Governor Ron DeSantis, he actually put out a video of Trump kissing Fauci and praising him. And this was something his campaign put out there. And it was not, it was not real. It was artificially generated. Um, and so it is important to understand that election lies are dangerous, whether generated by humans or by a machine. But I'm also here to tell you that while artificial intelligence does have its scary components, it can be a very useful tool in order to combat what we're seeing and what we're gearing up for. And so one thing that I like to encourage people to do is if we know that bad actors are utilizing tools to try to discourage people from voting, to cause confusion at the polls, then we have to be willing to utilize those tools ourselves to be able to come up with rapid responses. And that is the only way we will be able to successfully combat what's happening. So what can we do? First of all, we need to connect like we're doing now, have these conversations. We don't need to wait until January to have the conversations. We need to do this now and start coming up with a game plan. We need to organize and come together. And last but not least, we need to serve. What good is having information if we are not going to utilize it to serve our communities? And that can be through education. It can be as a volunteer. We understand why it's important to vote. That's why we're on this call tonight. But here's the thing. We have to take it a step further. It's not enough anymore just to go to the ballot box. We have to utilize the information we have to serve someone else and to bring someone else along with us. So one thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. I'm going to put in the chat. Um, I have a link that I would like to share with you. So this is an interest form. I talked about various roles of election protection that we're offering. So I'm going to put this interest form in the chat for you to look at. If you're interested, please um, be sure to fill it out. So the first one is the interest form. And then um, this next one that I'm going to put in there is actually going to be a web page on our website that breaks down each of the roles and the interest form is at the bottom of that. So you don't have to feel pressured to fill this out immediately. If you want to do some more research and understand the roles that I talked about, um, the page that breaks that down is also listed there as well. Um, and I will open it up for if anyone has any questions. If you put your, uh, raise your hand through reactions, it'll be helpful because I can, I can also see your hands, but I'm trying to, it makes it easier if you put it in reaction. Did I see your hand, uh, D? Clancy? You're on mute. I, I just clicked it. Okay, thank you so much. I, I was looking for where I should do it. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, what common cause was thinking about to um, 
uh, prevent uh, the alleged or supposed uh, candidate, Republican presidential candidate, from saying that uh, he was elected if he isn't. And um, we saw this before, and, and I think we'll see it again. And I'm just wondering how Common Cause or any others of us can prevent this. Yeah. So this is exactly why we felt it was necessary to have that post-election component as well. Because if you followed what happened in 2020, a lot of that was starting to come out once the numbers started trickling in, right? That's when you started to hear more of this rhetoric around, oh, I won, oh, find me these votes. So if we have people physically placed there for every aspect, we can say, hey, we know what he's saying, but we had someone physically present. Everyone followed everything to a T, made sure every T was crossed, every I was dotted. There is no need for anyone to question um, the truth behind the count that has been put out there. Um, so that is exactly why we are emphasizing having someone present for every step of the election process so that we can um, say in confidence that what he's saying is not right or whoever, it might not be that particular candidate. Let's just put it out there. But if it's some, if it's a falsehood, we can point to the fact that we had someone present um, and saw with our own eyes what that process looked like. Thank you. Thank you. Tina? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm sorry if you had already answered this question. Are you going to be sharing your slides in case maybe I can refer to them if somebody asks a question about, you know, because I'm involved in a lot of things and people talk and ask questions. And I like to keep information. This is great information. I just want to keep it. Yeah. In case, and so I could go back yeah. if I need the information again. Yeah, I will be more than happy to share the information that I talked about. And it might Thanks. even be easier if I put it into like an electronic packet. So let me speak with my team. But yes, I will share the information. Gladly share that information. Thank you for the question. Liana. Hi. Um, I see that you guys are requesting for more people to um kind of be at the polling place and serve in different capacities. But because of what happened in 2020, and I'm just going to go out and say it, we know that it's going to happen again with some like um, more aggressive people on certain sides. Uh, is there any protection measures that you guys have thought about for poll workers that we've seen get harassed? And yeah. that may be a reason some people don't come back this year. Yes, we do have protection measures in place. Um, and I I have some people who have served as volunteers for me. Um, so I didn't talk about this as much because I go in a deeper dive in the training. But first and foremost, at any point, if someone feels uncomfortable, we tell you to remove yourself. Your safety is our number one priority. Um, another thing that I want to emphasize is that when you're out in the field, you are not by yourself. Um, we have our command center and we actually have attorneys on hand to address any issue that comes up. So it might, even if it's just you or you and just one other person, it is important to emphasize that you are not alone in this process. And another component of what we have done in the past um, is also train people on some de-escalation tactics as well um, so that if something is getting out of hand not saying that you have to feel obligated to do that but that you at least are equipped to be able to de-escalate the situation and get out of there we will never ask you to stay in a predicament or a situation where you would be in harm's way at all and we have protocols that we um, follow for that so I appreciate you for that question Liana. Any other questions? Agnes, you pretty much answered. Oh, Jackie. Yes, uh, Agnes. So if people want to volunteer for election protection, how do they do that? And what additional training do you provide? Okay. Um. So the first link that I put in the chat, um, that 
lets the if someone's interested they can fill out that interest form because i am in the process of creating our mobilized links for our trainings um so as soon as those trainings are available i will reach out to each of those individuals myself to let them know these trainings are up whatever you're interested in please be sure to register and we provide we provide training for um roving pole monitors poll watchers, digital democracy activists, and post-election. The only thing that I did touch on that we don't train for is going to be if you're an election worker because each um, local uh, election authority has their own training for that. But everything else we train for and we provide you with your materials, whether it's the, you wearing your election protection shirt and we give you a actual guide to keep with you for election day as well. Thank you so much for that question, Ms. Jackie. While we're waiting to see if there are any more questions, I just want to say to Agnes, she did a presentation for Rainbow Push, and they've turned it into a two-minute soundbite that they use every Saturday to talk about election protection. And Ms. Betty, I think I think we're we're thinking of doing one for um missing disinformation here soon, huh? Yeah, I think so. Are there any more questions? Don't everybody say I at once. I think your presentation was so clear that people pretty much got the answers to every question they had. The last one I was concerned about was the AI. And I still want to get some more information on AI. That that's really scary to me. I understand that you you and I will definitely have our long conversation on that for sure. So I will turn this back over to our chair. Ms. Thank Grimshaw. you very much. Thank you much, uh, Betty, and thank you, Agnes. Uh, I agree with Betty. You were very clear, uh, and I think you answered most questions that I could anticipate. So uh, good thinking for us. So we didn't bombard you with a whole bunch of other questions. So 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 thank you much. Uh, I encourage um, you know the the participants here to please look at uh, the the links that Agnes posted. Think about how important it is for our democracy to make sure that we are watching the election, that we don't allow the misinformation and disinformation particularly Misinformation happens, but this information is the evil thing that we have to combat. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, we're on the lookout. And I think, you know, I, I'm not, I, I am an occasional social media person, but every time I go on social media, I manage to find the, the bad stuff. I don't know what that is, but you know, maybe my luck is just bad. But, you know, the, some of you I know are more regular uh, uh, check-ins, have more regular check-ins with uh, social media so now that you know what you can do about it, um, don't just get mad about it and definitely don't disseminate it, but report it to, to Common Cause um, so that they can do something about it because they are the professionals in this realm and not us. So we want to respond, but we don't want to try and we don't, we don't want to do anything that will help the disinformation spread uh, any further than it's already already going. So with that, um, for tonight, thank you. Is there anything else that people have questions about? Any other presentations they'd like to see or hear? Uh, any other uh, uh, questions about CWTA? Anything we could spend the last few minutes uh, to respond to? I think we should also bring back uh, Dr. Armwine. She was the person that created the 1866 our vote she did that when she was with the lawyers for civil rights in dc she created that line and it turned out to be one of the greatest things we could have as relates to elections i yeah. used it continuously on election day because people will call rainbow push because they don't want to call the authorities they don't trust them and i'm forever referring them to the 866 our vote you got it all right. So one of the things, Betty, uh, that I think we need to work with Kat on is making sure that I, our our uh, Facebook page has information. Reflects that. Right. Okay, uh -huh. we'll do. 
Okay. Anybody have anything else they want to share before we say good night and happy holidays to everybody? Um, we will uh, not be meeting on the first Monday in January, obviously, because that is New Year's Day, but we will be meeting the following Monday. Uh, I think it's January 9th, 7th, I can't remember um, the date, but we'll be the second Monday of January. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, just send us emails if you have questions, if you have ideas, if there's something you want to do, something you want us to do. Um, you know, this is all about what did Agnes say? We got to connect, man. We got to right. connect. So we got to stay in communication and in connection. And so all the ideas are not uh, on the CWTA board and it comes from you and we're here to serve you. So we want to hear from you. So, so let us know, stay in touch. And Agnes, again, thank you much. We appreciate it. And we'll look forward to that uh, packet of, you know, how we described it information that we can share uh with with everyone so with that unless there's something else tina you came on mute do you want to say something no i just came on to say goodbye i love this group thank you very much ladies for making it happen and um we just have to continue to carry the torch for justice yeah. for all right yes i don't know <laughs> that's what we I, I just I just feel like comfort this is like a my security blanket a comfort <laughs> because you think you're out there alone you know trying to m make things right whenever you can when you see so much corruption and injustice and just scammers and predators and just all the bad apples mm -hmm. the bad actors Right. Whatever, however you want to call it. I just feel very blessed at the moment that there are other people out there trying to make the planet a better place for us people um, who really are seen, not even seen, let alone heard. So I'm sorry I continue to talk, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everybody's work. That's thank right. you for your applause, Leona. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think, Thank we, you. I think we all need to we all need to remind each other of that. So really appreciate that, and um, and and really appreciate this evening's um, presentation. As we as we go into this year, there's nothing more important. Amen to that. Okay, all have a happy holiday, uh, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas, and we'll see you in New Year's. Yeah, see you next year, Happy guys. Holiday, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.